panelists and I thank all our panelists that we should continue to do what is right for us, not expect uh, China to change its ways at all. This map adventurism, uh, Harshingla ji, namaste. Thank you very, very much for joining us, former foreign secretary uh, with us. This map adventurism, sir, this tactics of the PLA, how do you see it? Well, you know, um, I think the PLA or the Chinese government has always resorted to tactics that are designed to give them an advantage in the, you know, uh, boundary and consolidating their objectives in that regard. Uh, I don't think we need to be unduly worried. You know, we have always displayed a very firm attitude when it comes to Chinese attempts at uh, transgressions of the boundary. You saw that in 2020, uh, Chinese attempts at translation were met very firmly. That was the same in 2017 at the Doklam. And Doklam was really the point at which we said, here is where we make a stand and you're not going to go any further. And I think uh, that principle or that approach, the firm dealing uh, of issues relating to foreign policy with nation first uh, approach that Prime Minister Modi has displayed, uh, I think has uh, really served our interests very well because uh, whether it is, uh, you know, attempts at Ladakh or Sikkim or Arunachal or Uttarakhand, I think we have not allowed any uh, such attempts to uh, result in anything to our detriment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we have established a very firm line there uh, that uh, while we have an approach that is, uh, you know, uh, designed to encourage uh, good and peaceful and amicable relations with all of our neighbors and partners. Uh, we will not tolerate any attempts that would compromise our territorial sovereignty, integrity or our security and defense preparedness. And from that point of view, I think this government has always followed uh, under Prime Minister Modi a nation first, India first approach. But Harshwardhan ji... This is, uh, as I said, held us in good stead. Uh, please explain to our viewers this cartographic adventurism, aggression, Diplomatically, what is the CCP's game plan? From their perspective, uh, they would, uh, you know, draw the map the way they see it. Uh, if they obviously uh, have a claim, uh, even though it's specious and extremely, uh, you know, a far-fetched uh, claim, uh, the fact of the matter is they're trying to show that as their territory. Uh, their attempts to rename places, their attempts to uh, as you say, cartographic aggression is something that uh, I think uh, we will have to be resolute on as far as we are concerned. And I quote uh, Foreign Minister Jayashankar here when he said, just because you name your, you know, my house um, with, with your name, it doesn't mean it becomes yours. In other words, just by naming these territories, you don't gain those territories. Hmm. These parts of Arunachal Pradesh have been a part of India, are a part of India and will be part of India. Well, there will be no compromise on our territorial integrity whatsoever, irrespective of, uh, you know, such uh, shenanigans on the part of, of, of China. Mm. Uh, and I have to say that, you know, it is not a new exercise. They have been doing this in the fourth such attempt. There have been other attempts in many other areas. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what you need is an absolute firm uh, resolve. You need to hold your ground. You need to be resolute. And I don't think you need to be unduly concerned. I mean, your what is important is that uh, your territory remains yours and there is no way we are going to compromise. But uh, le let me ask you this. Why shouldn't we resort to the similar uh, cartographic strategy? Why shouldn't we show Inner Mongolia, the Xinjiang or the new territory region and Tibet separately? And what is the middle China separately? You see, I mean... Our maps are based on our, let's say, um, depiction of the boundary. Hmm. And those depictions are based either on our claim or, you know, where internationally there is a demarcation, then you follow that national line. Where there is no demarcation, uh, then you follow uh, a line which is in accordance with your uh, historical and, uh, you know, legal claims. Uh, so, whether it is in the Ladakh sector or whether it is in Arunachal, etc., you are drawing the map as it is, uh, as, as you see it. Hmm. Um, I don't think, uh, you know, we need to indulge in cartographic aggression of that nature as long as we are clear about what represents our territory and what is, uh, you know, for example, POK. Hmm. 
uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir is depicted as part of India, which directly is. Hmm. Uh, and uh, and uh, even though we may not have de facto control, but de jure is part of India, so you depict it. Hmm. Uh, so, but for us to you know uh, start depicting or rechanging the boundaries based on a response to someone else's, uh, I would say uh, somewhat no. uh, hmm. immature uh, attempts at uh, at uh, you know. Um, uh, securing their interests uh, in a way that is, uh, I would say, um, non-productive or counterproductive. There, there is not something that we need to get in. But, but uh, Harshvardhan ji, we have here at News 18 only depicted and here on our maps, they depicted Xinjiang separately, Tibet separately, Inner Mongolia separately. And it's a cartographical rejection of the entire One China policy because these are all disputed territories whose inhabitants claim that this is nothing but forcible occupation and this is not China. Well, that is uh, that is a policy decision and that is a decision that we have to uh, think through carefully. Um, there are countries, uh, we are not the only country uh, in, in the world that, uh, you know, recognizes a one China policy. I think there are a uh, majority of countries in the world recognize that. Mm. There are historical basis, etc. Uh, but uh, nothing, you know, status quo is not, uh, you know, doesn't go forever and doesn't last. Uh, there are always extenuating circumstances, and I think it's it's uh, a decision that government has to take, a considered decision. So, from cartographic adventurism of the CCP to uh, some territorial uh, misadventures of uh, erstwhile former leaders of Bharat. So, Arunachal Pradesh to Kachati. Well, let's just uh, switch focus. Documents that have come to light of what had happened back in 1974. How would you analyze the entire turn of events? <clears throat> well, uh, let me uh, take up what you mentioned in terms of, you know, the comments uh, made by the Prime Minister and the External Affairs Minister and the comments made by the opposition in terms of the, uh, of the mm. Parliament questions and responses thereof. Now, there is an official approach and there is a political approach. Officially, when you have a question in parliament, you provide the facts. The facts are that, uh, you know, there was a delimitation exercise in which Katsya Thivu was, hmm. became a part of Sri Lanka in 1974. And there was a subsequent 1976 agreement in which fishing rights were also deprived. I mean, our fishermen are deprived of those fishing rights in the 76 agreement. Yes. So, in response to a parliament question, you are responding on factual basis. That is what you are supposed to do. But there is a political imperative that has come out based on the RTI and I suspect, I mean, having dealt with uh, Sri Lanka extensively as Joint Secretary in the neighbourhood right? Uh, and this issue of Kachatibu, when I've seen it at close quarters, both in terms of what we did with the Supreme Court and our interaction mm. with the Tamil Nadu government, etc. And of course, the Sri Lankan side. Ji. I can say that, uh, you know, it's uh, in many senses, uh, I think the documentation which is out in the public domain is very timely. Public needs to know on what basis their leaders and those that they have had reposed confidence in, uh, what decisions they've taken, how they've taken those decisions, what is behind those decisions. And I think it is only correct that this point has been brought up. And keep in mind, it is 50 years since the incident. So many classified documents are declassified after 50 years. Right. So it's correct that such documents are out in the public domain. What does it bring out very clear? Hmm. One, it brings out the fact that during British times, hmm. Uh, even though when, Brit when, when, the, uh, when the British government tried to separate the Indian dominion with their Ceylon mm. dominion, mm. at that time Sri Lanka or Ceylon then made a claim for Kachati. Mm. The British government took the view that no, that was untenable and kept it as part of British India. Mm. Subsequently, if you noticed, uh, there were various opinions, mm. um, which, which uh, you know, even post-independence, which said that Kachati, we had a very strong case to keep mm. it. Yet, the government of uh, Indira Gandhi, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and the Congress hmm. insisted on going ahead and making Kachatiwa part of Sri Lanka. Now, you may say that it's only a small uh, you know, piece of territory, but with that comes fishing rights. Yes. With that comes an entire area that you can fish. I mean, after all, Kachatiwa is only 12 kilometers off the, the coast of, uh, you know, coastline of Tamil Nadu, Ramnathapuram. And historically, uh, the Zamindar, the Raja of Ramnathapuram, collected land revenue from Kachati. He has the tax records. Hmm. And that is what that's what led the British to also hesitate in giving Kachati to the Sri Lankan or British Ceylon. So, for a sovereign government 
to go and then hmm. give Kachatibu to Sri Lanka in that under that uh, I would say uh, boundary uh, agreement hmm. was uh, not only uh, an incorrect step, but I think has in many senses it's a uh, it is a breach of faith of the public, hmm. and that what makes it more aggravated is the fact that. Historical re- the records, if you see right. the records of which have been now released in the public domain, indicate that DMK Patriarch, Mr. Karunanidhi, was briefed in great detail and he informally concurred to that agreement and those arrangements, hmm. knowing fully well the implications of Kachatibu going to uh, Sri Lanka. Hmm. It has deprived fishermen of Tamil Nadu, of India, but- the right to fish in very lucrative uh, waters. It has actually been the basis of many problems that we have had with Sri Lanka because over a period of uh, you know ten years, some six thousand odd mm. fishermen of ours and over a thousand boats have been impounded, uh, mm. you know, uh, by the Sri Lankan authorities. Mm. Uh, I think it has made it difficult for our fishermen to to uh, undertake their livelihoods, and it is clearly uh, something that uh, really government should have thought of. And in today's context, I. Prime Minister Modi been there, and had he been following foreign policy, I can assure you this would never happen. Because for Prime Minister Modi, it is Bharat first, India first, it is the people of our country first, and then. But Mr. Shringla, in those days, I think uh, there were other, uh, you know, considerations, uh, and I don't know what those considerations were. Uh, but uh, there is no when it comes to foreign policy, I think there cannot be any consideration other than national interest. But and clearly, but, but, uh, national interest in this case hmm. has been compromised. Hmm. Uh, that means your interests of your citizens have been clearly compromised as history has hmm. has revealed to us over a period of time and that uh, this decision unfortunately uh, you know all of us who dealt with it at that time felt that it it appeared to be one that lacked either legal or or uh, you know historical basis for us to take that decision to give that area to sri lanka uh, but at the same time i think uh, you know it has had consequences that were totally avoidable and but I think Harshwardhan the Harshwardhan the Congress party and the till DMK these have documents to came so you you're saying Congress and DMK are to blame but till these documents came out 21 letters if my memory serves me right multiple letters have been written by MK Stalin chief minister of Tamil Nadu one as recently as when Ranil Vikramasinghe came to Bharat where he says that the state government was kept in the dark and that Bharat should reclaim Kachatibu because Tamil Nadu was not party to this transfer This is what I was saying that the DMK has been very aggressive about uh, the issue of fishermen's rights, about uh, Kachatibu belonging to India. They've uh, you know gone to court. They've impeded the Supreme Court. The Tamil Nadu government has been impeded in it. But at the end of the day, we are dealing with double standards because this is a party that knew all along that they had compromised on these interests. So uh, the point is that on one hand you wink and you you know there's a wink and a nod. And on the other hand, you take a take in, take up an issue as though it is an issue that is uh, in your in the interests of your uh, sort of electorate and your citizens, and I think this is today what we are really doing is in the interest of transparency, in the interest of true democracy. Prime Minister Modi has raised this issue, Dr. Jayashankar has raised this issue, Anamalai ji has raised this issue, and I think this issue needs to be in the public domain. Our people need to know. Hmm. I think I've always maintained I mean, as a as as a former. Foreign Service officer, that you know, it is important that decisions taken in the foreign and security domain hmm. are also made available to the public, so they know on what basis leaderships have ta- leaderships have taken decisions in their behalf. Right. And these days have gone in which you took decisions on specious grounds. I mean, you know, I heard someone uh, saying that this was to facilitate the return of Indian origin Tamils back to India. Correct. I mean, we have been fighting all along for Indian origin Tamils to be nationalized. Those who want to stay should be allowed to stay. But if those who want to return can return, who is stopping you from returning? Here? Why is that a reason to keep Kachatibu or give Kachatibu to Sri Lanka? So this doesn't make sense at all. And I think the fact that Sri Lanka is 12 nautical miles off the coast of India, much closer to India than Sri Lanka, uh, I think doesn't. Actually, I mean, there was absolutely no reason for our uh, fast, uh, uh, you know, uh, Congress leadership well, to have. The, uh, see, to the have distortion taken aspect is also that and it was a Sirimau, Sirimau Shastri arrangement, uh, Harshvardhan ji, in terms of the repatriation of uh, Tamils, six lakh Tamils, and not uh, the Indira Gandhi government. The, but the aspect is also why talk about it today? Because Kachatibu is gone. We are not going to get back that island in any case unless we fight a war with Sri Lanka. It's not going to happen. We don't want to do that. There's no situation. So why bring up our, this issue and raise this issue now? 
No, as I said, I've always maintained that uh, you know, 50 years down the line, when documents have been declassified, hmm. they're available in the public domain. Public has the right to know. Hmm. And what uh, Anamalai has done by asking for RTI is basically putting into the public domain what should be there. Hmm. And the Prime Minister has only reinforced the facts that uh, emerge from this document. So there is no harm in bringing this out in the public domain. And I said these are actually issues that should become a part of the public discourse because these are the issues on which people need to take a verdict. Hmm. I mean, people of Tamil Nadu should say that despite crying horse on this issue, the DMK is actually an accessory to this. Issue. They were acquiesced in the handing over of Kachathi to uh, to Sri Lanka. The Congress Party has been, you know, I would say instrumentally behind it, but the DMK has been a part of that hmm. uh, decision. No. So I think that is very important, and also important is the fact that uh, uh, you know um, uh, even for the future, uh, you know this is a salutary lesson that you know uh, any such issues uh, you need to have a certain level of public buy-in. You can't take decisions which But are based on considerations. Some and those, of these there were considerations, and we should know. There's But nothing on the record, even classified documents. I don't think show. What the, is the thinking? The classified Mrs. document. The classified documents. Food, the classified uh, documents say that there was domestic compulsions and also external compulsions that uh, favored an expeditious settlement. It was pointing to some oil reserves that we may have had there, and of course the external compulsions being the pro-China lobby in Sri Lanka. If Pachatibu was handed over to Sri Lanka on consideration of oil, then uh, where is that quid pro quo in the last 50 years? I mean, there is no trace of any quid pro quo in on those considerations. And today it becomes a totally different issue because these are sovereign. As per the agreement, these are sovereign waters of Sri Lanka. They can give it out to various uh, companies, and I think this is also a matter of serious security concern because sir, at the end of the day, Kachatibu is, as I said, 12 nautical miles from. Sir, I'm reading. I'm, I'm actually reading from this document. We've got the excerpt of the document that have been released. Record of talks held in Madras with Sri M. Karuna Nidhi, Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, on the 19th of June 1974, and page number six here, point number ten. And I'm reading. Foreign Secretary pointed out to certain domestic and external compulsions favoring an expeditious settlement. Among the domestic compulsions, Foreign Secretary stated in strictest confidence that oil structures are reported to have been located in the area, and that at present the Sri Lanka side is presumably not aware of this. If settlement is delayed and knowledge about oil strike becomes available, settlement will become intractable. Among the external compulsions, Foreign Secretary mentioned. Persistent threat from Sri Lanka to begin exercise jurisdiction. In view of extensive drilling operations, they have already begun in the Gulf of Mannar area. So essentially, you're handing over an area to ensure that your, uh, you know, security interests are protected. I think it should have been the other way around. We should have taken the area to ensure our security interests are protected because security interests are not short term. They're not. They're medium term and long term. 50 years down the line, you've left us with a situation where your security interests are compromised. So the external factor also says foreign secretary pointed to existence of a very strong pro-Chinese lobby in Sri Lanka, which is eager to take advantage of any misunderstanding between Bharat and Sri Lanka, and which may be urging them to refer to the dispute to arbitration or even go to the World Court to embarrass India. Tell me how giving Kachatibu to Sri Lanka has, in some senses, alleviated that concern 50 years down the line. Then and now, uh, I would be greatly enlightened. I mean, how is it? How is this argument? Uh, you know, how does this hold water? At that time, you were concerned that foreign interests were coming in, so you must give Kachatibu to Sri Lanka. And today, 50 years down the line, I mean, we have seen no evidence of all that. And today, 50 years down the line, that that becomes a reality for the reasons that are absolutely opposite. To what mm. actions you have taken in 1974, 1976? Mm. But that other question of yours, basically on fishing mm. rights, yeah, you know, and what can we do? The point is that I think uh, External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar has made a very valid point that we can look at exploring mm. in our discussions with the Sri Lankan side fishing rights to our fishermen in or around Kacha Tibu. That is something that he's spoken about, and I think that's a good way to go about it. Uh, agreements are agreements, uh, and and you know agreements that relate to boundaries and relate to uh, territorial integrity of states are those that so, are 
um, that are you know uh, right. sort of vested in many senses uh, in the United Nations. They are ratified. But you can actually uh, try and address some of the issues uh, given here, a good relationship, a uh, sort of a mutual framework of cooperation, collaboration, something that is possible. But, but here is so the he's concern. So he's spoken about that the, the and, external, and I think that, the, that seems to be… Uh, Harshwardhan ji, here is the concern. There is a block C1 that the, that the Sri Lankans are now auctioning. This block would have been part of Bharat had Kachatiwu not been ceded. These blocks are now being auctioned and this is all in the Delft Thailand and the Kachatiwu region. And there are Chinese companies that are bidding for these. It may go to certain Chinese power companies and other agencies, clearly state-backed. Is that a huge security concern for us now? You see, there's a director of the historical division in the Ministry of External Affairs. The historical division dealt with all the treaties and legal uh, matters, hmm. boundary issues. That is why the director of the historical division, Basu, yeah. Accompanied Foreign Secretary Kevil Singh to Sri Lanka uh, to Tamil Nadu to brief uh, yes. Ji. Uh, there is another director that. called A.S. Basin, Aftar Singh Basin, who has yeah. written a very nice number of books on the border. And he has said uh, Nehru was preoccupied. He was obsessed with global peace. And to the extent that he was willing to compromise national interests in order to achieve uh, the interests of global peace. And con contrast with it today, I mean, we are contributing. Prime Minister Modi's contribution to global peace has been far more effective and, you know, manifest in today's context. Yet, his policy of has always been Bharat first. India first, Indian citizens before any others. Hmm. So we have never compromised on our national interest and our security while working with the rest of the world and bringing about global order. Right. So I think a lot of decisions, whether it is a question of taking Jammu and Kashmir to the UN and UN Security Council, Gee. whether it's a question of having you know lost uh, undue amount of uh, land in the Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir sectors, whether it is a question of Kachati, these are issues that are historical legacies today that uh, that our foreign policy has to deal with but these are mistakes of the past Gee. and it's important for people to start asking these questions that why did we make those mistakes what is it in those leaderships that failed us why is it that in today under prime minister modi we are we are actually addressing these issues we are trying to you know mitigate some of these issues Gee. we are today in a situation where india is considered as and prime minister modi is considered as the vishwa guru a vishwa mitra hmm. we are a friend to a vast part of the world but we are not going to compromise on our basic core interests and our integrity. So that is the policy and everybody is aware of that policy. Jay. And I think that is what is something that people in our, in our public also need to keep in mind. That there is a huge contrast between foreign policy conducted, you know, um, in the past and, you know, today's foreign policy under a very, very different leadership that believes in a new India and believes in the people of India. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Harshwardhan Shringla ji, uh, for speaking with us and for putting matters into perspective. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, sir. Namaste. We take a very short break here on The Right Stand. Stay with us.